is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Travelers, Season 1, Episode 1. Oh my god, I just realized I didn't check out what the episode title is. My bad, sorry guys, but I'll tell you in a second. In this episode, this is a hard concept to wrap my brain around, guys. There were some things that I really was like uncomfortable with, but I think that was the point. There are some things that I really, really liked. I am going into this like feeling pretty good about it, but also nervous about it. Does that make sense? There was a lot here. That's all I'm saying. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So first of all, I want to uh, thank Meg- Michael Kioski. I hope I'm saying your last name right, Michael, um, for commissioning these episodes. I had not even heard of this show, which is kind of funny. Like a lot of times when people commission things from me, it's something that a few folks have mentioned I should try covering or, you know, I've just sort of heard of because so-and-so from this show is also in this other thing that was pretty popular. Um, oh, the reason I didn't remember the name of this episode is because it's just called Pilot. I feel a little bit better now because normally I don't make that kind of mistake. Um, <laughs> Devin is here in the comments saying, holy shit, I literally was just laying down to go to sleep and this popped up. I had no idea this was commissioned. I love this show. Well, welcome. I hope that you enjoy this. Um, so yeah, this episode was the introduction to a f- <laughs> several people who go by the name travelers who are as we find out at the very, very end of the episode, um, they are using a newly developed technology from the future to take over what they call host bodies of people who were supposed to have died at a specific point in time. And they have the knowledge of exactly when and where this person was meant to die. And they they managed to get into their mind and take over their body from that exact moment so that it simultaneously circumvents this person's death, but also is uh, continuing on as somebody that all these other folks like know of and, and have had in their lives for years And now they have to suddenly deal with a person who has, for no discernible reason that they can understand, a totally new personality and basically (laughs) the goals and uh, drives of them as people are gone. And they have this other whole mission that they are here to take care of. Um, Michael's here. Hello. I hope you like this episode. The premise is definitely fucked up, but also really fascinating. Yeah, I agree. And so, all right, I'm, I'm going to get into, because that's the, that's the premise of this first episode, but you're not told that right away. You start to gather that that's what's happening because of the clues dropped about the way that their time of death is, is projected up while they are experiencing this obvious excruciating pain in their head. And all of a sudden they're, eyes blink open and they are looking around like they don't know exactly where they are. They're looking around them like they're not, uh, they aren't like what I find really particularly fucked up about the way that this works. You would think it would be just taking over somebody's body, which obviously that's kind of fucked up, but what are you going to do? But really it's the fact that somebody is going to wind up in the body of a person who is currently, in mortal danger. And this is for me, like, so anxiety inducing a couple of these situations. It's something that they can easily sort of step away from. Like we have the moment where, um, 
this with this guy who is in the middle of a boxing match just decides to forfeit the game and he doesn't keep pushing himself because that is what was going to kill him was getting hit again but then there are people who are in the middle of a fight or being assaulted um we have people who are uh you know the, then we have one that they can't prevent, as it turns out, because the time of this guy's death was due to a heart attack. And that's not something that they can like step in and fix it. That's a physiological thing that cannot be altered. So that person t is taken off of the options list for a host body. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like, to me, like adjustment that you have to make. You're suddenly in a new body. You don't know exactly what's going on, probably. Or maybe you do. Maybe they have complete information about exactly what was happening because they're from the future. But I, I think that that has to depend to a degree on the kinds of records that are kept. So if it's somebody who's like more well known and had people around them to witness what was going on, you're going to have a very different situation than a person who's alone in their house and wound up dead like you know this woman who has the abusive ex-husband or ex-boyfriend he might not even they might not even have been married ever um so i would imagine that there are probably i i always think about these kinds of logistical things and i can't help but think that there have to be folks who are like all right i'll travel and i'll take somebody's body but i am not going into some situation where there's gunfire or i have to make like crucial decisions within a split second i want to go somewhere where there are plenty of people around and there was something happening that we can all like have people jump in to help and whatever and i would be that person i'd be like you better fucking help me with this okay i'm not I'm not messing with that. I've got enough on my plate getting into a new body and figuring out what the fuck to do. I don't need to worry about all this additional shit. So when we start off this episode, we have this, this first uh, host body and her name is Marcy. Um, she is developmentally disabled in some way. Um, and it's really clear immediately that she isn't able to read very well. Um, she has a really bad stutter, but she's also obviously very good natured. And the woman who is leaving the library that she cleans tells her that she needs to remember to take her break because she always works too hard. And I really liked this little moment because it points out that this girl is somebody and I call her girl even though later I won't because she has a very young vibe here because of the fact that she's developmentally disabled. There's just an innocence and a childlike quality to her. And it feels like she's, it feels like she should not be allowed to be alone in this building working. You know, she just feels like that shouldn't be something that they are able to do. But we have this scene where the woman, the librarian, I would assume who is leaving the building, um, she is going outside to her car behind uh, Marcy, who is sitting and having her break and having some coffee with her back to the window. And you can see just the very faint, like outlines in the background out of focus of several people gathering around her. And first of all, I need to say that this moment of seeing what's going on, I was like, oh, God, what is this? Like, is it going to be that there's a bunch of racists? Is it going to be that there's a bunch of misogynist rapists? It, ¿Por qué no los dos? Why not just do all of it? It turns out, yeah, it seems like it's all of it. Because one of the first things that they do is, like, rip her shirt open. And they're, like, pouring booze all over her, which I... I have to be honest, when I first saw this, I really thought they were pouring gasoline on her. I thought they were going to light her on fucking fire. And I will say, at least it's not that, but it's just as bad, really. It's just that in particular is so like cruel and unusual that I was like, whoa, are we really doing this? But yeah, this guy is like holding her hands back while these other two fucking drunken assholes start to rip her clothes off. And this girl inside is 
banging on the windows to get their attention to let them know, I see what you're doing and you need to stop because there is somebody else here witnessing what's going on. Unfortunately, she does not have the like foresight to go to one of the desks and call cops or something. She just sort of waits to see if they have taken off. Like she goes and hides somewhere in the library. She falls down. And and I kept thinking because of the fact that she fell here, that this was how the hosts uh, are taken over was that it took a traumatic brain injury in particular for them to become vulnerable to somebody getting into their head because the the person we go to right after this is a boxer. So same thing. So I started to think, Oh, okay. So is it like, you have to be like hit in the head for this to happen, but no, it's just that you have to be about to die. So this girl, Marcy, um, thinks that these guys have left because she's super precious and is not like understanding that now she is, pray for them. These are fucking predators. They saw a woman all alone and nobody is around and the doors are apparently not locked. And she thinks when she looks up and they're gone that they just lost interest and left. She wrong. She goes outside and the first thing she goes to do is pick up her friend's purse, which I find really, again, so sweet that she's not just trying to get the fuck out of there. She's like, Oh, she dropped her bag. She's really going to need that. Like, you know, yeah. And when she does that, these guys come up on her and surround her. And it says recorded time of death and it's counting down from 40 seconds. And they're trying to yank her bag out of her hands. And she is saying, David gave that to me. And we meet David later and it becomes really clear why this means so much to her because David is somebody who's like, almost like a parent. He just is caring for her, checking in with her all the time. He's her social worker and he's a good one. He's somebody who gives a shit and is not going to take advantage of her. She's a young, really beautiful woman who shows up at the door naked at one point and he's made incredibly uncomfortable. And that may just be because he's not straight, you know, for all I know, but it, it's a nice vibe to have somebody who isn't even tempted. You know, he's straight up just like, okay, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. And he says like, I can't be your boyfriend. Remember we talked about this. And I love that line as well, that like she has expressed this. And I have to say, I have, um, there are a couple of people that I have known in my life who were developmentally disabled and wound up getting involved with somebody that I, and I found it to be, really questionable that it felt like they were being taken advantage of. And that's one of those things that I always try and examine because whether or not somebody has a sort of like mental disability does not mean that they are completely incapable of making their own decisions or understanding like the complexities of things. They may be unable to express it really well um, or they might be unable to process it as quickly as some people, but that doesn't mean that they just like have no agency at all. So I always sort of like have this reaction of just being like, well, that's a little bit weird and I don't really like this. And then I sort of have to stop myself and go, but is that valid? Is that a fair way to like view the situation for this person that I'm concerned about? Am I just being way too paternalistic? But I really like the fact that David is obviously just straight up concerned about her as a person and her being a potential romantic partner is so not a factor for him. I, I just really like the guy out of the gate, you know? So anyway, these guys hit her and I think that, um, because she goes down, but she's obviously like having a, an, an episode that is outside of the assault. Uh, um, so what I'm saying is that it seems as if the damage from falling earlier is what killed her here and that it's not these guys that killed her. It's not excusing them. She ran and everything because they were uh, like about to assault her friend and they are clearly about to hurt her until she starts to have this sort of like seizure but it's a an interesting twist to have this all happen and yet not actually be the result of a direct assault, which is, of course, what I expected. 
And this leads to some problems later on because the person who is in her body um, is having some seizures later because there's remaining damage. You know, there's this, when she fell, I don't know if she had damage to begin with because we don't really, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we learn the origin of her disability. Like, I don't think we know that it's, you know, something that was um, a birth defect or if she was like abused or if there was something else that happened that like caused to stunt her growth or something like this. Um, so I don't know if there was some sort of damage existing already and her falling the way that she did exacerbated it or if the fall was it and that just really fucked her up. And whoever is in her body now is realizing that they shouldn't have put her. I'm saying her because it's hard to like look at this this young girl and hear her voice and be like, oh, maybe it's a guy in her body. But that's certainly possible. We don't really know how this works yet. Um, so I'm going to continue to call whoever is inside of her a her also until proven otherwise, just for the sake of simplicity. Um, and this this person inside of her is like, I need to get the fuck out of this and get into another body. Like this is not how this is supposed to work and this isn't going to help anybody. And the, like, I'm really interested in whether or not they usually sort of like check for this sort of trauma before they decide to take somebody as a host. Like I would imagine traumatic brain injuries and stuff, that kind of death is going to be off the table because that's such an integral part, you know, like even a physical injury, like injury, like losing a leg, you're still going to be able to function, you know, it'll be difficult. You'll have to get all kinds of, um, of help and access, but you're still going to be able to like be out in the world. But if you have a brain injury, that's causing this kind, these kinds of like glitches, which are what these seizures feel like, because it's almost like there's something, that feels technological about the whole thing, even though I know that this is a human body. Their access to these bodies is because of a techn technological advancement. So that's why I keep thinking of it as glitches versus like a seizure. Um, but yeah, so I'm interested to see if they are able to locate exactly where the trauma is and repair it, if that's even going to be something that they worry about, or if they decide they're going to like just you know, bump this person into a new body. Are they able to do that is the other question. Because again, we don't know how this works. So can you just pull somebody's consciousness out of a body and into a different one? Do you have to pull them all the way back into their own time and then find a body and put them or can they just bounce from one body right into the body like standing next to them? Um, I'm I'm just really, really curious about how all of this stuff works. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm 20 minutes into this episode, and I haven't even like talked about anybody else. But this is when we jump to the next dude, and I cannot remember his name, um, who is in the ring. And it's like, obviously, a not above board fight. And he is there's a friend of his that's standing outside of because it's like a cage match. There's a fucking fencing around them to keep them from, you know, getting out of here. This dude tells him, you need to fucking forfeit this because he's just better than you, which is the exact wrong fucking thing to say, obviously, to this dude, because he looks at his friend like, oh, really? And it's like, the sort of thing that I wish that that I, I wish and I don't really, but I kind of wish that this was a little bit more of a like get out situation where the original owner of the body is like somewhere in there and able to see that they were really fucking prideful and they were about to literally die because they didn't take their friend's advice because their feelings were hurt. I would like to just see moments of somebody learning something is all I'm saying. But yeah, this dude who is, uh, who he's fighting against is doing these like martial arts, like flipping through the air kinds of things and gets him in the side of the head. And this kid would have been dead. And oh, his name is Trevor. Okay, got it. 
And um, we find out later that Trevor is up for like a football scholarship potentially. And he is really taking some risks by going and getting into these fights because he could fuck his hands up. It's what his father points out. He could probably fuck up a whole lot more than that as well. But that's what his father is specifically thinking about because of the punching. Because they're not using gloves. He's got like thin sort of like weightlifting gloves on, but they're not, you know, boxing gloves or anything. Um, so he goes down and then he has this moment of uh, the person taking over and stands up and says, I forfeit the match. And then we cut to... A couple of dudes who are shooting up heroin and we find out like later on that the first guy who shot up overdosed. Now I wasn't sure because like ODing is something that I know can happen in a couple of different ways. I thought that whatever it was that they got was somehow laced with something else that it was like, um, basically just like a bad batch, you know, but from the way it's talked about later, this guy just did too much, but his friend is also supposed to die. He's also scheduled to die. And that's what makes me wonder if it wasn't just a bad batch, if they both OD at the same time, is it just because they're both feeding each other's habit and doing too much too often? Or is it because whatever it is that they were using this time around is tainted somehow? Um, but either way, he is about to shoot up and somebody else winds up taking over before he manages doing it. And when he wakes up, he looks over and you can see that the other dude who shot up is not doing super well. He is, I thought for a second that he was already dead, but you see his eyes moving around a little bit. You see minimal, minimal sort of movement and indicators that he's still breathing, but you don't actually like, there's no indicator that he's okay. We see a little bit of like drool come out of his mouth. And that's one of those things that, again, I don't know enough about this sort of thing to know whether or not that's in particular, a sign that somebody is ODing, or if that's just something that happens when you shoot heroin. Like, I would imagine you lose control of all kinds of bodily functions, probably. So drooling, I wouldn't put outside of the realm of possibility, just like with a normal hit, right? Um, but whoever wakes up in his body is just like, oh, shit, and like gets up out of there and probably knows that his roommate is going to die. But they don't step in to stop this. They don't call an ambulance to try and like save this guy. And this is an interesting thing to me because I understand them not being able to take over the body of somebody who is about to die from a physiological reason, such as a heart attack. But there is a, an additional aspect of not being able to interfere with the death of somebody that you know is supposed to die and is not a host body. And I want to know what that rule really is all about, where that originates from, because he can't, he, he later on watches that uh, lawyer have this heart attack. And like, he, he is uh, the possibility of going to the guy's car and getting his cell phone and calling an ambulance is still available to him, but he doesn't do that then. And he doesn't call an ambulance for his roommate now. Why not? What exactly? Because they're here allegedly to help mankind along the way of, find their way down a path that does not end in their own destruction. We find out like mankind is almost completely died out. So what they're here for is to sidestep some of the worst tragedies and uh, keep some attacks from happening and things like this. But they are apparently instructed to only interfere on that scale 
that it has to be some official mission business and individual deaths are not something that they are allowed to even touch. I'm really curious why, because I understand like, oh, well, we can't change everything, but I guess what it, what my real question is, is how does time travel work in this universe? Because depending on what you read, there are some things that like you can change what wound up happening. Other things you can't change it. Every time you try, it will wind up happening anyway, like kind of like a Greek myth sort of thing. Then there's things like, um, you know, in Endgame, for example, they are able to go back in time, but doing that does not change the future because that's technically their own past, which has already happened. So there's all kinds of, of different rules depending on who you're reading or watching. And if there is a rule in place about not being able to save individuals, I feel like that has to be because something happened at one point. Somebody made a mistake or somebody got distracted. Um, and I'm just really curious about that because I feel like if they're, if their objective is to help humanity, like be better and, and stay alive as a species, maybe some of these people would have been able to help with that if we had kept them alive, or at least maybe they'd been able to get on a better path, you know? So that's just something that I'm kind of putting in my back pocket to like, be interested in later if they decide to talk about this. Um, so then we go to a young mother with this adorable fat cheeked little baby. Um, and she is heating up some formula. It looks like for her crying child as she sees her ex or whoever getting out of his car and she can tell just from looking at him that he's drunk. This is something that's obviously happened many times before. And she goes and tries to like lock the door to keep him from coming in and tells him like, you promised that you weren't going to come around when it was, when you were like this, but he has a key. Um, so he's able to just come in and, the like expression on her face is somebody who has had to deal with the inevitability of this person continually pushing their way into their lives when they are not wanted, when they are like, when they have made mistake after mistake and are not acknowledging those mistakes. This is a really, her body language just really says everything here. And he comes in and wants to know why the baby is crying. And when she says it's because he's hungry, he's like, well, then give him something to eat. Like, she's a fucking idiot. Like, she doesn't know to feed the crying baby. Like, but then, of course, when she says it's baby food, he's a baby. This dude is like, oh, don't talk to me like I'm an idiot. And then he hits her and he hits her really fucking hard. She goes down and, like, hits her head, I think, on the edge of the counter. And it is a hard moment to watch that it's just her just like he doesn't know this, but we find out later if he had hit her again, she was going to die. And I have no doubt that it's because of this initial injury of like hitting the corner of the counter. We find out later that this dude is a cop and I would look just like to really quickly appreciate the fact that the show has done this because like something astronomical, like 40% of officers out there have a, like allegations of domestic abuse levied against them that they are almost always able to weasel out of because they're fucking cops. So there has been a couple of, uh, there's been a couple of moments of hot tea over the past few years in discussing what the deal is with not wanting to institute background checks and more gun control. And some people have pointed out the reason that so many folks are against background checks and looking for signs of domestic abuse, because almost every mass shooter has a history of some kind of like abusive past. There what the the uh, theory is, 
is this would cause so many cops to be unable to carry their guns because they all have had such run-ins already that have been covered up. So what I'm saying is almost half of police officers have domestically abused partners. And the fact that this show has just decided to be like, here's one I really appreciate because it's just so tempting to not want to look that in the eye. And I am concerned about what this is going to do later on, because this dude is still watching her. He's obsessed with her. He gets taken down in the street at one point, And I had a real moment of panic about a black woman fighting a cop in the street. Yeah, he's her ex. And yes, he's also a black man, which puts him at a disadvantage in that front to a degree. But the badge really does override that. And I really was kind of worried that this was going to fucking come back and bite her at some point. And I'm hoping, desperately hoping, that he does not continue this campaign. But men like this, they don't give up. They don't let go, especially with an abrupt turnaround like this. She suddenly learned how to like fucking defend herself and she has said like and i mean that like in a physical way i don't mean like oh she suddenly got a spine no i don't get me started about that kind of talk what i mean is she is physically able to fight back in a way that you know the previous owner of her body had no understanding of how to do that kind of like you know maneuver flipped him over onto his back you know um and I feel like that is going to be something that this man cannot deal with because abusers, what their deal is, is they need somebody to be absolutely submissive. They want to be in total control. And there is no bigger lack of control over a woman that you have previously been hitting than her literally being able to like humiliate you in the street. And that's just, and he was in uniform at the time, like everything about it knocks him down so many pegs that with the kind of personality he has, there's clearly no choice for him but to like escalate. And I am just really nervous about watching this unfold. When I said at the start of this, ep uh, of this episode, that there were some things that made me a little uncomfortable. What that is, is that we have an immediate scene of a black woman being assaulted by white dudes and then another woman being assaulted, um, and that is what, you know, had triggered the whole thing. And then this woman is almost killed by an abuser. So it's two women out of – it's – what? There's not a single other woman, actually, is there? The only two women whose bodies they take over are victims of gendered violence. And it's one of those things that I'm really, like, on the fence about – exactly what I would prefer. Because as much as I don't love coming out the, out of the gate with this sort of like really upsetting scene, the show doesn't dwell on it terribly much. It's not like it feels voyeuristic. And it's a reality that women are, are killed by men at a crazy rate like that is a, a huge cause of death for us is dudes. So there's a reality to this that I also am just like, I would love if we weren't going there, but also is not going there just being kind of dishonest and like, you know, like maybe you're being a bit of a chicken shit if you don't want to face it. I don't really have an answer. You know, it's, it's, a tough thing to walk that line of wanting to include a reality, but also not wanting that reality to be like a major plot point that you feel everything hinges on. At the same time, when something happens like that to a person, it does change them forever. You know, that kind of trauma is like, it's just going to change who you are as a person fundamentally in the fabric of your being. So sh maybe any time that happens, it should be a major plot point. I don't know. I just would like to address it. The fact that both women were going to die at the hands of men and that one of those women could have been herself a boxer. We could have done that, but we didn't. 
You know, one of these guys could have gotten into a fight himself on the street because there were some guys that they that he fought with at a bar. You know, there could be all different ways of doing this. And I just can't decide if I would want that or not. So I'm just putting it out there that this is something that I was thinking about. Um, so anyway, Carly gets up and she doesn't fight him back at this point. She just clearly has an expression on her face of somebody who has had fucking enough. And she looks at him and she has a different look in her eyes. She's got a different posture to the way she stands. And he immediately apologizes and leaves. But he winds up trying to come back um, the next day and gets really, really pushy with her when she tries to put some parameters in place for when he's going to be allowed to see his kid for how much he's going to financially support her because evidently that has not been a thing which color me shocked um so that is the end of the cold open and then we see this dude trevor looking in the mirror at himself and kind of smiling and i wonder about that there's something really sort of there's something sort of like pure about that of him being like, oh, check out this body, you know, even though he's got two black eyes and looks like fucking hell. It's uh, a, there's a sort of sweetness about it, you know, and you can see that in the way that he interacts with everybody. His really hot girlfriend comes over and wants to bang him immediately. And he's like, ah, mm, no, I don't think so. Again, I'm really curious if there are parameters around their missions that that dictate whether or not they're able to sleep with people. Like, because when you come right down to it, you are raping this person because they are not aware that you are not the person that they think you are. It's, it's rape by deception. It's not like, you know, physically forced rape, but it is lying about who and what you are. And, I would appreciate that being in place. It probably is unavoidable at times if you are trying to keep up the pretense that you are a certain person and it takes longer than X amount of time for you to accomplish your mission and you're seeing this person around all the time and you continuously just push them away. I would imagine eventually at some point it's going to start to like either interfere, interfere enough with a relationship that you need in order to complete your mission or cause them to question who you actually are in a, in a way that like feels sort of futile because they're never going to really understand. Nobody's going to be like, I'm wondering why you're pushing me away. It's obviously because you're possessed by another human being. No, but I'm just, you know, I'm just curious again, what's that about? Oh, Michael says the key to enjoying any time travel story is knowing how much to worry about ethics. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. So, and this would definitely fall under ethical questions. Um, so I'm just, you know, interested in, and it makes me wonder too, the person who has taken over uh, Marcy's body, when she answers the door buck ass naked, is she just not aware that she's naked or is she trying to like seduce this guy and see what he will do in response or I'm just really because there's two times that it seems like she just doesn't notice that she has no clothes on. And I'm just kind of like, what's that about? Why are you so like, that feels like you come from a whole other culture. Um, and speaking of other cultures, we have this moment of uh, Trevor getting the uh, text where his girlfriend asks, are you okay, babe? But she doesn't in text speak. The letter R, the letter U, okay, babe. And he looks at it and evidently in the future they don't talk like this anymore because he reads it and just goes okay and seems totally baffled rock like he has no idea what this means and i'm like how how do you not know this in the future they don't do texting like how do you have the kind of technology where you can go back in time and take over someone's consciousness but you don't know what text speak is what's that um so his mom comes down and is very worried about him. His father is just angry, but it's that kind of anger that is born out of worry. Men are not taught really a lot of times how to express emotions that are 
vulnerable, like really caring about what happens to somebody. And th- thus, the emotion that does get expressed is anger, because that's how they know how to like interact with the world. And I so what I'm saying is, I feel like his mother and father are really coming from the same place. But his father is just choosing to express it in a very different way. And when he her his mother is like talking to him about um you know sco- scoot upstairs get ready and and she hands him an apple and uh, he takes it and says thank you mom and both his parents stop dead and stare at him like they like he swore at her or something and his dad says thank you mom who the hell's that not knowing how completely to the heart of the matter he just got like nail being hammered in, but he has no idea because of course, why would you? Um, And that just makes me wonder what the fuck was Trevor like before? Because the fact that just saying, thank you, mom is such a departure that his parents stop short as if they've been burned by acid. That feels like this dude must've been absolute garbage. And I'm just really like, I'm really curious if we're ever going to find out more about who these people used to be. We learn a fair amount about Marcy because of her social worker and having scenes where he's actually talking to a doctor about her history. So there, these moments are just these, uh, sort of, it's almost like, um, an exposition dump when he's talking to this other doctor. So we have more info on her than anybody Everyone else, there isn't really something in place for people to be talking about them to each other like this. So he remains a little bit more of a mystery. Um, we have um, the other girl. Let's see. We have Marcy, who is the woman who was disabled. And then this woman, I know it was something really similar that also ended in Y, wasn't it? Like, I'm not going to say it was Darcy, but it was something like that. Um, But she is on a weird looking website. And when we go to the heroin addict, he's also on the same website and they're entering these numbers and symbols um, saying traveler such and such. And they give like a four digit code that's obviously their assigned number, letting people know that they have arrived and where they are. And I really like the system that they have this in place and that they have figured out how to make this system work in a world that does not function with the same technology that they have. But it's a really efficient system, obviously. Or I won't say really efficient because you have to be able to get to a computer. um, And that's not necessarily a guarantee, but they're working pretty well with what they've got, you know? So he's in the middle of entering his information. It looks like he's in like a, um, a internet cafe or something. And Detective Gower comes up and starts questioning him about his roommate who OD'd. And I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier because I said it was his lawyer who had the heart attack, but it was Gower, the detective. Um, and that, like, this this dude immediately sees that. Like, wait, when he introduces himself, this detective, he repeats the name back, Gower, and is obviously distracted from the subject at hand, which is his roommate overdosing by the fact that he's looking at somebody he knows is going to be dead and that this won't be prevented in a couple of days, maybe hours even. Um, So this is when we go to uh, David finally appearing and Marcy opening the door buck naked. And uh, at first I think he just sort of, um, he, I think he sort of like writes it off as her uh, having gotten hit on the head and not really like being too with it. When he sees the cut on her head, he's really like worried about it and is like, you need to go see a doctor. Like, that's pretty bad. And he winds up like getting her to go and see the doctor. Meanwhile, we have the addict being questioned. And the detective puts a bottle of Coca-Cola in front of him, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with this trick, 
But if you don't have somebody's fingerprints on record already, that's a trick that cops will use, which is to offer you a, a drink while they question you and you pick it up and put it down. And that they that's like totally legal for them to take your prints that way. So it feels like they're trying to set this guy up, even though this detective is saying your prints were all over both of the needles. But the fact that he is putting this drink out the way that he is makes me feel like he doesn't actually have those prints. I think I think he's lying to try and get him to confess a little bit more quickly. And it's a really like the scene is uncomfortable because this dude is like when the detective says you knew he was going to overdose and you left anyway, it's very clear from this dude's face that that's exactly right. That's totally correct. That's what happened. We know that too. Once we find out everything later that he knew that this guy was going to die and he left anyway, because that's part of how this works. But it's a shame to watch his face be so transparent in the moment because he isn't interested in trying to deceive this detective. That's not part of the deal, evidently. And just telling him, no, I had no idea. I mean, my I helped load a couple of the needles, but I went out to do something and didn't realize what was going on before I shot up. Like, you know, not that that's a believable story, but there could be any number of things that he could say. And rather than saying any of them, he sort of has it written all over his face that the, te the te detective is correct. He doesn't argue back and immediately asks for a lawyer. So this leads to him meeting his public defender, who is one of those guys that's like, um, it feels like he could do the right thing sometimes, but it also feels like, as we see later, that that's not necessarily something he's worried about. When he does the right thing, it's for his own reasons, not because it's the right thing. And he gets a little bit greedy. This this kid, because he knows who the fucking guy is, when the public defender is like, I am very familiar with addiction. You don't need to lie to me. The kid asks, what's your addiction? Is it gambling? And the lawyer looks at him in this way that's like, obviously, I'm not telling you shit about me and tells him that it's cigarettes. But clearly, they're aware, this person is aware of exactly what it is due to whatever files they used to have. So this is when we discover their ways of getting the money that they need in whatever location they are. So he takes advantage of attorney client privilege here to get this lawyer to agree to place some bets using a certain amount of money. And all of these bets, of course, come through. I love the fact that the lawyer specifically says at one point that some of the bets were so stupid that he had to go to like two bookies because nobody wanted to take the bet. Um, and this winds up triggering a bit of greed in this dude who apparently does have a gambling issue. And he starts really hassling this kid for more information because he thinks that he's got some sort of like inside scoop, which he obviously does, but it's not the kind of inside scoop this dude knows. And I'm really curious whether or not he knows more than just the race numbers and, and outcomes that he gave him for this initial bet. It, are you restricted to only knowing exactly what you need to know for the mission so that you can't continue to take advantage? Or did he memorize a bunch of stuff and is just has just given him a portion of the information that he knows? Like, I would think that you'd have to know more than just the one in case the money you have turns out to not be enough and you need more. Um, but I wonder how often that happens, you know, like how much money did they wind up with and how fast does it normally go? Maybe they're just really good at calculating how, how much they need and how often. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that I'm not skipping anything because we have the scene with uh, Trevor's girlfriend coming over and eventually like he goes to school and his friend straight up asks him, why are you here? And he's like, well, why, what do you mean? Why wouldn't I be here? And 
he says, well, you got a free pass to stay home for the rest of the year. And he says, and fail to graduate? To which his friend replies, yeah, like that was going to happen. I want to know exactly what's going on here because the football thing, I mean, you know, we've all heard about this kids that were so that excelled so much in athletics that they were given incredible leeway that makes no sense in every other aspect so that they were able to continue moving up a grade level and continue playing because usually playing a sport is considered a privilege. And if you are not able to pass certain classes or if you get held back, you get stripped of your right to play as a punishment for not doing better in school. And there are a lot of schools my, not mine. Like the school that I grew up in, sports was not really a thing. Not that we didn't have teams, but we were not any good. And there was nothing on the line for us in terms of like trying to get into state championships or anything like that. It's a very different culture at a lot of other schools, especially in the South. Like down here where I live now, it's a surreal experience for me because like uh, merchandise supporting the local high school football team is sold in like grocery stores here. And all of the banks in the neighborhood put up, uh, like put paint on their windows during game season. That's like go Hornets kind of things never happened where I was from. It's so much more of a presence here. So this is, this, uh, dude is clearly being given leeway, but this is, a level of leeway that I have never even heard of where he's just allowed to stay home and not do anything. How? What I've always encountered was people who got their grades fudged a little, who didn't really pay attention or weren't really gifted academically. And their teachers were just encouraged to let a lot of things slide, but to straight up not attend and everybody just lets that be a thing. I have never heard of that before. So I'm really curious to find out what is going on here. And if anybody listening to this has seen this sort of thing for themselves, I would be very interested to hear exactly how that works, because it's apparently well known enough that his friend can just say it to him in the middle of the hallway. And it's not like this is a secret, you know, that they have this deal going. So anyway, um, he asks his friend, can I ask you something without you telling the entire school? And he asks, which locker is his? And his friend is like, oh, shit, did you get brain damage? And he says, uh, post-concussion syndrome. And his friend is like, yeah, and leads him to the locker and uh, does the combination for him. And I really love that he is able to take advantage of the being hit in the head story to explain. He says to his girlfriend, like, what can happen from this kind of brain injury is changes in personality and mood and all this sort of stuff, which is totally true. Brain injuries can do that. So he's able to really lean on that as an explanation for the fact that he doesn't remember things, that he's acting different. And that's very convenient. You know, it's too bad not everybody can do that. So in the background, as all, is the, all of this is happening, we have this FBI agent who has been alerted to some weird uh, web, it, weird web activity that is coming from certain IP addresses. And it's obviously very routine for him. Like he's going from house to house, uh, which uh, he's going to check out every IP address and make sure that whatever is happening at each of these homes is not the precursor to some sort of like terrorist attack or organizing a group of people to like get involved in something illegal or whatever. And I really love the way the tone of him approaching everybody, because you could do this as somebody who's being really like suspicious about it and being like, no, there's obviously something going on here. But this is so much more accurate, I would think, to the daily life of somebody who does this kind of job, that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's nothing. And you have grown to know that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's nothing. So everything feels a little bit, tiny bit, like a waste of time. It's your job and you're going to do it because there's always that chance. But it's really clear, depending on whose door he winds up knocking at and who answers, that he doesn't think there's anything going on here. He really just is like, 
oh, okay, you're a single mom who's living in this like shitty house. I really don't think you're involved in anything. Oh, okay, you're a social worker who like works with this young woman and has never been in trouble before. I'm sure it's fine. Like, I really love the fact that his whole attitude throughout is just sort of, I'm, no, I'm, I just needed to, I have to ask, have a good day. And then he just goes off on his way. And it's not until later that he starts to see all of these people congregating at the spot that he had seen in the, uh, in the messages. Ooh, excuse me. My voice just went out there. A little bit of a layover from being sick still. It's been weeks at this point, but it's still creeping out. Um, but it turns out that the reason they were so obvious about sending these messages and letting each other know where exactly they plan to meet is because he is going to be one of the people that they take over. So there's a, a moment first, and that this is what instigates the confrontation between the, um, the mom and her ex. He goes to her to like ask her if she's been up to anything and there's a moment where he asks her if she has any plans downtown tonight. And it's a funny little moment because like looking back on it now, we know that when he asks her that she's completely aware of the fact that not only does he know where she's heading, but that he's going to be there and will be all a part of this soon. Um, but she makes a little joke about thinking like, I thought you were maybe asking me out. And that's what causes like her husband sees them talking and seems to think that she's having an affair with this random guy who just knocked on the door and walked away. The dude didn't even go in the house. How do you what do you think is happening here? And it causes him to like come at her and she puts him down in the middle of the street. By puts him down, that makes it sound like she kills him. But we know that that is not what happens. Um, so in the end, after being, the, you know, the one detective, uh, chases the addict, um, and Gower winds up dying of a heart attack in an alley, which just feels really rude. We have everybody like meeting up at night at this abandoned warehouse. And this is when the detective arrives there's a moment when he follows them all up there and he is leaning over the, he like goes to this elevator shaft and he is supposed to die at that moment. That is supposed to be the moment in which he falls and dies, but he actually gets saved by Trevor and that this is when they all come out and explain to him what's going on. Of course he doesn't believe them, but then a second later, he gets taken over and whoever takes over his body looks around and is like, all right, looks like we're all here. And let's begin. And I really like, too, that he asks, where's the social worker? And Marcy's like, oh, David isn't one of us. Um, because I kind of feel like David's not going to be one of them in that he's going to be a traveler. But I have a feeling David's going to figure out what the fuck is going on. I have a feeling David is going to like be just dogged about figuring all of this out. Um, and I really like, so we have this moment because, Oh, Philip is the name of the addict. Thank God. I was just dying, not knowing their names. Um, when they're discussing with him, trying to explain to him exactly how we know where, like, because we're from the future that we use latitude and longitude to find out where, when somebody dies, they're in the middle of explaining this. And we see that woman's ex trying to get into the building, like um, walking around and yanking on the uh, handles of the door, trying to get in. And it says time of death at the top of his screen when he's here, but that doesn't actually wind up taking place during this episode. So does her ex die? And does something happen with that? Or was that a time of death that was supposed to relate to the detective or not the detective, the FBI agent? I don't think so. Because why would they put the time of death on the screen with a different character? 
But the fact that we didn't actually see it happen is really interesting to me. Um, and then we see in the background that there's this dude who is like dead on the floor. And it turns out that that is Jonas, who is somebody that everyone has at the FBI has had their eye on because they know that he is about to commit some crime that's probably going to take out a lot of people. And we hear that it was going to be a mass shooting and they came back in order to stop that from happening, among other things. So, yeah, I am just really interested in what the fuck is going to happen next. I have no idea where this is going, but it's a really interesting concept. Um, and so far, the acting has been really good. So that's also something that like, I'm not somebody who's really great about judging good acting and not I don't think I feel the same way about it as I do about writing. People will be like, oh, the writing was so bad. And unless the writing is so bad as to be like comical, I'll be OK with it a lot of the time. Um, so, but I felt like everybody in this was pretty convincing. So hopefully that trend continues. So anyway, um, I hope that you guys are enjoying the coverage. Thank you very much to Michael for commissioning this. And uh, I'm just I'll, I'm planning on rewatching this episode with Owen to see what he thinks of it, because I always like, <clears throat> if I can, to involve him in what I'm covering for Spoil Me, because it takes up such a, an extra amount of my time now. And I'll tend to just be watching things like when he comes home. And I'd like for him to not like get spoiled on something that he wants to see. So I'll uh, let you know next episode if there's anything that I caught on the rewatch that I didn't mention this first time around. But um, for now, this is all I've got to say. So uh, Michael says, you're asking a lot of good questions that don't occur to someone who binges the entire season in two days. That's what I'm here for, baby. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much for listening. And I will be seeing you again soon, hopefully, with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.